It's amazing how quiet things got. Well, if you are wondering who this stranger is playing the piano this morning while the choir was in the back, I have known him. I raised him at church camp. But he has now uh, become a grown man, and he has gone to work for J.C. Kirby Funeral Home here in town. And uh, he grew up in the Oak Forest, Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And so we're glad to have him in Bowling Green and glad that he's a part of our worship this morning, Kobe Wood. And uh, he plays the piano beautifully, as you can see. So we're glad to have him and anyone else who is visiting with us. And we must mention, if you haven't noticed, Paula and Dan Druin are here with us today. And we're glad to always have them back. Uh, they were such a part of us for a long time. And in fact, you still are a part of us and we're grateful that you are here. Last Saturday, the board meetings were supposed to meet here at our church, but due to the ice, everybody up toward Harnett, Kentucky, Lisbethtown, they all got a lot of ice. Some of them still have icy parking lots this morning and not having church. So all of our boards were rescheduled. That's Presbyterian boards were rescheduled, and they are here at our church on February the, thir February the 12th at uh, 9 o'clock. And then the council and staff will meet that day following uh, the Presbyterial board meetings. Uh, be sure you note all the announcements in your bulletin that are printed for you. And uh, are there other announcements and concerns? And by the way, you, you might have known that he would combine his 90th birthday. If you do not know, today is the 212th birthday of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Today we celebrate 212 years as a Cumberland Presbyterian Church. So they sung him happy birthday yesterday, but Henry, anybody who makes it as long as you have deserves a happy birthday in worship. So we're gonna sing it to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Henry. Happy birthday to you. And as the guy sung, forever young. <laughs> are there any other announcements before we begin? Once again, welcome you who are present with us in worship this morning, as well as those who continue to watch us every week online. This morning as we gather to worship, I am reminded of what a pastor friend of mine says often as he begins his worship. God's not looking for a place to visit, but God is looking for a place to dwell. And I believe that is true for all of us. God wants to dwell in you, God wants to be with you, and God wants to encounter you right where you are at this moment in worship. So join with me as you worship our Lord in spirit and in truth.
with me as we pray. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we gather this morning for no other purpose than to praise your holy name. And Jesus, as Jesus came offering prayers and petitions to you on the behalf of others, we pray as your servant leader and offer prayers for all of those who are gathered here this morning and those who are absent with us but wish they could be present. We know, O oh God, that you are aware of all of our concerns, our fears, our burdens, our losses, our doubts, our hopes, our joys, our dreams, and our needs. But we also know, O oh God, that you understand our suffering, our pain, and our brokenness. So as we gather to worship in your holy presence this day, 
we give all of it to you, Jesus. And ask that you allow us to feel the touch of your healing power and grace upon our lives. Let the words of your scripture and the teaching of your son, Jesus Christ, be a light to our feet and a lamp unto our path. And may all we say and do honor and glorify you. For we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. There's just something really special about today. I don't know if you feel it, but when we're singing, Give Me Jesus, we've been studying about the name of Jesus. Even in the Lord's Prayer, it said, Hallowed be thy name, thy name Jesus. So this morning, I hope you enjoyed Give me Jesus in the morning when I rise. The first thing, give me Jesus. So would you stand with me this morning together in our voices? We're going to sing, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word.
Would you just put that first part on the screen again? Let's just sing again. One more part of that. His name is wonderful. He's wonderful. He's my Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all of my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me Your goodness is running after, it's running after me with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing the goodness of God I will sing the goodness of God
Good morning. Oh, goodness. Today, I have with me Bubbles. Everybody likes Bubbles, right? Woo, yes. Good. Um... And now it's gone. Everybody likes bubbles for different reasons. Some people just like looking at them. Some people like popping them. Um, and for adults, even adults like bubbles because maybe it just brings you back to being a kid. But bubbles are an excellent representation of happiness, right? We've all been happy, just like we've all been sad. And we've all been mad. Think about the best day of your life when you went to Disney World or, yeah. <laughs> right. When we think about the happiest day of our lives, the thing about it is it ended. We had to leave Disney World. We had to go home or go back to school. It was kind of lame. Yeah. Um, but Jesus gives us something beyond happiness. It's called joy. And in fact, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's joy. And Jesus says, if you abide in my love and you keep my commandments, then I will give you the spirit of joy. And joy is like happiness, but it never goes away because God is always with us. So, when we think about happiness, it's when we're in pursuit of, like, going on vacation or getting a toy. And eventually, the happiness from that goes away. But Jesus never leaves us, so joy never leaves us. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to learn about you. And, uh, I pray that you surround us with joy throughout our week. In your name we pray. Amen. Failed to mention earlier that the flowers on the altar table this morning are in honor of Jude Connor Carroll's birthday given with love by his grandparents, by David and Jamie Carroll. And also, uh, Johnny's not with us today. I mentioned to mention earlier, he was diagnosed with COVID the early part of the week, but is feeling much better. But his doctor just advised him to stay home today. But uh, he wanted you to know that he is doing much better. Okay? Johnny Douglas, our organist. Okay? All right. At this time, as we continue in our worship, we prepare our hearts by these words with the giving of our tithe and offering. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened and can, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let us give freely of what has been freely given to help others whose burdens are heavier than ours. At this time, we invite our ushers to come forward for our morning tithe and offering.
generous God, you have showered us with gifts, including the greatest gift of all, your Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God, we come before you in thanksgiving and praise, and we offer these tithes and offerings in our very selves. We ask, O oh God, that through the actions of the way we use these tithes and offerings, that we show to the world what a blessing you are to our life, and ask that you not only bless these tithes and offerings, but bless us who have given this day. For it is in Christ's holy name we humbly pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson is found in the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. I'm going to read a portion of a much larger discourse, actually one of the largest discourses of Jesus with another person. Beginning with verse 7, when the writer writes these words. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. When a Samaritan woman came, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask for me a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If I knew the gift of God, and it is he who, that asked for a drink, would you have asked him, and would he have given you living water? Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Also did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't go thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Let us pray. Oh God, we are always amazed by the way your Holy Spirit prepares our hearts for worship and for the hearing of your truth. We ask now, O oh God, now that all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, for it is in his holy name that we humbly pray. Amen. Tom was a pastor of a local downtown church, and as busy as he was, he always made sure that he had time to go down to the homeless shelter at least once or twice a week and serve in the soup kitchen. After all the homeless people who came that particular day had been fed, Tom would invite them into the small chapel for a service of Holy Communion for any homeless person who would like to come. Tom shares that one day he has an unforgettable experience in a communion service. As he was moving down the altar rail of that chapel, he came to a man who was kneeling. And he had looked like he had been on the streets, Tom said, for a long, long time. The man looked up and Tom, at Tom and he said in a very whisper, Skip me. What? Pardon me, Tom, the minister said. In a louder voice, he said, skip me. And the man said it again. And why, Tom asked, because the man looked at the reverend and he said, because I'm not worthy. And the preacher looked back at him, Pastor Tom did, and said, neither am I. And then Tom looked back at him again and said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on down the rail and I'm going to serve everyone else who is kneeling here communion. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to serve you. And the man blinked at Tom because, and Tom said, not only am I going to serve you, you're going to serve me. And the homeless man looked up and he said, is that legal? He said, yes, that's legal and we're going to do it. 
Tom went all the way down the altar and he served all the other people who were kneeling there. And then he came back to the reluctant man who had said before, skip me. When Tom came back this time, the man still kneeling on his knees, he said, sir, what is your name? And he said, my name is Josh. And then the reverend said these words then. Josh, the body of Christ broken for you. His blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Eat and drink this and do it in remembrance that Christ came for you and that Christ died for you. Josh blinked back, but Tom noticed that tears were coming down his eyes when he received Holy Communion. Then Tom knelt down in front of Josh before the rail, and he gave Josh the bread, and he gave him the wine. And the reverend said to Josh, now you serve me. And Josh nervously took the trays and the cup. And he said, once again, are you sure this is legal? Yes, just do it. And Josh's eyes started darting all around as though as he looked for the FBI or the CIA or someone to come in rushing to arrest him. And finally, he took the tray and he offered him the bread. And he muttered, body, blood, hang in there. After that communion service was over that day and all the homeless people had gone, Tom said of all the communion rituals that he had ever heard in his life, he said, I don't ever remember anybody saying, hang in there. But he said the one thing that he did understand in that moment that there was never a more sacred and holy moment when he said, body, blood, hang in there. And Josh, that homeless man, walked out of that chapel that day with an extra little pep in his step, telling everyone, you won't believe what I did today. In fact, in the future, everybody referred to him as reverend. And when I read that story, I, I, I think it's a remarkable story because it's a true story. It's a story of love. It's a story of acceptance. It's a story of forgiveness. It's a story of grace. And interestingly enough, I think this story reminds me of the powerful passage from the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, which records for us the encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well which for the woman at the well, it too was a life, holy, changing moment. It was a moment of grace for her. And that woman, just like Josh, she felt unworthy. And she too wasn't really sure that her encounter with Jesus that day was legal. She too, like Josh, was accustomed to being sneered at and talked about and looked down upon as an outcast. For the woman who Jesus encounters at the well that day, society had not been kind to her. Because if you read the entire discourse, you will know that she not only had one husband, she had five husbands, and she was currently living with another man. And there were, which prompted many scholars of that time who have then interpreted this story to say she was probably no more than just the promiscuous town harlot. While other scholars surmise that she was really probably a victim of her society in that day. Why would they say that? Because you see, in the day in which this story occurred, it was the man who got to divorce the woman. And undoubtedly, five men had discarded this woman already. Whatever the case is, there's one thing clear. She was an outcast. And yet when Jesus encounters her at the well, 
he reaches out to her with love and compassion. Just recall the story with me briefly. According to the text, if you read it in its entirety, it says it's around midday, which means it's around noon. And it's probably that day, it was probably over 120 degrees in the sunlight. And Jesus had been walking in the heat for quite some time. And according to the text, the disciples had gone into town to get some food. And Jesus is simply resting at the well, probably sitting there in the shade, probably trying to cool off. And while Jesus is waiting, this woman from Samaria comes to the well. And when she comes, we all know that she has many strikes against her. First of all, she is a Samaritan. And Jesus is a Jew. And Jews and Samaritans had been at odds with each other for over 400 years. In other words, they didn't get along. Second, she's a woman, according to many, who has not so good of a reputation. And probably so bad that the reason that she's at this well, instead of the well that she was closest to, this woman, to get to the well that she's at, She's walked over a mile because she's probably been banished from the well that's near her home. Most people, when they saw this woman, would have turned away and labeled this from this woman. But notice in the text, when Jesus encounters the woman, he doesn't turn away. He turns toward her. And immediately Jesus asks her to share with him some water. And she was in astonishment that Jesus even spoke to her because I said, he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan and they don't associate with one another. In other words, is sharing this water with me, is it legal? Do you know this woman thinks, do you know who I am? And Jesus not only shares the water with her, But he goes on and he carries a conversation on with this woman and tells her the good news of the gospel and what the living water of Christ will do for her life and how it will give her forgiveness. And the woman, as the story concludes, it says she got so excited that she throws down her water jar and she runs back to town to help everyone that she has encountered Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I love this story for many, many reasons. And this morning, I only want to talk about three of them with you very briefly as we prepare our hearts and lives for the table of Holy Communion. Because I think that they get to the essence of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is truly about. The first thing that I look at when I think about when I read this story is, is that did you notice in the text, she doesn't reach out to Jesus first. Jesus reached out to her. Jesus takes the initiative to reach out to a Samaritan woman. Jesus didn't hesitate, he didn't wait, he took the initiative. And that's one of the greatest things about the Christian faith is that we don't wait for people. We should take the initiative to show the love and grace of Christ first. Notice the woman at the well does nothing to merit Jesus' attention. She does nothing to earn his forgiveness, nothing to deserve his love. It was freely given, and Jesus took the initiative. Jesus sought her out. Jesus reached out to her. Several years ago, I had a good friend's daughter was going through a very, very difficult time. She was married at that time. She was 35 years old, and she had been married several years, and she had several children. He was so proud of his daughter, and then something snapped in her life. Her life became a train wreck. One train wreck after another train wreck, after another train wreck. She was constantly in some kind of chaos or trouble, which eventually ended in her losing her children 
and her marriage ending. However, her father was a good friend of mine, and I knew that he would never give up on his daughter. He kept praying for her, that someday she would get her act together. He kept on loving her, taking the initiative toward her. But finally one day he went over to where she was living and she had left town and she was gone. And months went by as he shared with me, he heard nothing from her. And when he finally did hear something from her, all the reports that he was getting back, they were very hurtful reports. And so finally one day, my friend heard that his daughter was at the Union Rescue Mission in Nashville, Tennessee. So what does he do? He leaves where he lives in West Tennessee and he drives to Nashville. And the first thing he does is he goes to the rescue mission. When he arrived there, he reaches out and takes a picture of his daughter and shows it to everyone who was there. And what he concluded after that day was either they had not seen her or they were not saying anything. But before he decided to leave Nashville, that day and go back to West Tennessee, he took a picture of himself with his daughter and he put a note upon the bulletin board of the Union Rescue Mission in Nashville. And this is what the note said. I love you. I forgive you. Let's have a new beginning. Come home. Love your dad. The father didn't find his daughter that day, but two weeks later, his daughter comes home and she's dirty and she's hungry. But he was glad because she was okay other than that. And she looks into her face of her father and she says, I could not believe it when I walked into that rescue mission. I could not believe what I saw with my own eyes. I saw my picture and yours hanging there with that note, forgiving me and pleading with me to come home. And she said, it was in that moment that I realized how much you loved me, how you had not forgotten about me, and that you were always taking the initiative to reach out to me. Which leads me to ask, where does someone like her father learn to reach out like that and to love like that and to offer grace and forgiveness like that? I think all of us, if we've ever had an encounter with Jesus Christ and he's changed our life through his amazing grace, we know that her father had learned it from Jesus the one who spoke to this woman at the well and says, I know all about your past. I know about your present. I know about your reputation. But I want to tell you something Jesus said. I still care about you. I still love you. I still forgive you. I want your life to begin anew. Jesus reached out to that woman he took the initiative. He did not wait. And I believe that's what Jesus calls us to do. He wants us to reach out to people like the woman at the well. He doesn't want us to stand around and wait. He wants us to reach out and to love those who need the grace of God. But not only did he take the initiative, Jesus did something that is quite remarkable, maybe not to us, but in his day, it was very significant. Jesus broke down the walls and the barriers that divided people. Jesus was known according to the book of Ephesians. When you read the book, it says in Ephesians 2.14 that Christ has made us one and has broken down the dividing walls. And we see it so vividly in our text this morning. Look at all the barriers and the walls that Jesus knocked down in our text. First of all, 
he broke down the wall that divided men and women, the walls that separated Jews and Samaritans, and the walls that separated a receptacle rabbi and a notorious outcast. All in that encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well, all of those walls came tumbling down because of grace, love, and forgiveness. I was in a business not long ago, and they had a sign up on their wall that read like this. It said, to err is human, to forgive is not our policy. Now, I'm sure that the people who put that sign up thought it was kind of funny. But sadly, the reality is, is that some people live like that. But Jesus did not. Jesus believed in forgiveness. Forgiveness was his policy. Because Jesus, better than anyone in his humanity, understood what bitterness and prejudice and hatred, whatever it is that exists in one's life, all those things do is put up walls and separate you not only from God, but they separate you from others as well. And so I think Jesus not only calls us to reach out and to love others, Jesus calls us to join with him in helping knock those walls down that divide people and to build bridges of love and compassion and grace and forgiveness. Jesus took the initiative toward the woman. He broke down walls that were barriers between people in that day. But most of all, this is the thing that touches me the most about the text. He changed her life. He changed her life. She came to the woman, the well came to the well as a sinner and an outcast. And she walked away that day as a forgiven sinner through the grace of God. Many historians have said that she is the first missionary evangelist. She was a woman. Because what did she do? The moment that her life was transformed, it said she threw down her water jar and she ran back to town and told everyone what she had experienced. She was so excited. But at first she was suspicious and standoffish when it came to Jesus until she realized who Jesus was and the change that he could make in her life. And notice that that transformation in her life didn't come through judgment and it didn't come through criticism, but it came through the fact that Jesus loved her and that Jesus accepted her. He included her. He showed respect to her. Not long ago, I was visiting the hospital and I was approaching the elevator and there was a man who recognized me and he said, aren't you a minister? And you know, when someone asks you that, it always makes you a little, are you a minister? And I said, yes, I am. And he then looked back at me and said, you recently, you probably don't remember me, but I did a funeral. You did a funeral for a friend of mine. And he said, I was there that day. And ever since I was there that day, I've been wanting you, I've been wanting to come to your church. I said, well, why don't you come? And he said, if you do, I'll meet you and I'll greet you. He said, I don't think so. He said, I'm not really ready for that just yet right now, Pastor. He said, I'm enjoying life and I'm having a lot of fun. And to be honest with you, I'm hoping for one of those deathbed confessions. 
And I don't know what that meant to you, but what it meant to me was, is he was saying that somehow he thought that becoming a Christian took the fun out of life. And yet, there's nothing farther from the truth. Because a transformed life by the grace of God is one of the most meaningful and purposeful and joyful, amazing and wonderful life you can have. And that woman at the well that day, she experienced all of that. Why? because Jesus took the initiative and reached out to her. He overlooked the barriers and the walls that divided people in his day. And he loved her with his unconditional love. Jesus changed her life. Today, we have one of the greatest opportunities, I think, in the life of the church. We get to gather around this table. And just like Jesus was present at that well, Jesus is present at the table as our host. And he comes today reaching out to you, reaching out to to all of us, taking the initiative toward us to offer his grace, love, and forgiveness for our life. What better place to me can you encounter the love and grace and forgiveness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than at the table of the risen Lord? Let us pray. Continue, O oh God, to prepare our hearts as we gather around the table, not only with you, but with all of those who are part of the body of Christ. We ask, O oh God, that as you extended your grace and compassion and mercy and forgiveness to the woman at the well, that as we gather around the table this day, that we experience your grace, compassion, forgiveness, love, and mercy. For it is in Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen. As we have all heard on many occasions on the night that our Lord was betrayed, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus took the bread and after having given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, this bread represents my broken body, which gives you life eternal. Jesus said, take this bread and eat this bread. And as often as you eat this bread, Jesus said, do it in remembrance of me. In like fashion, the Apostle Paul says, then Jesus then took the cup, and he held the cup up in their midst. And he said, drink you all from this cup. And he says, as often as you drink from this cup, he said, do it in remembrance of me, proclaiming my death until I shall come again. Let us pray. Oh God, when we gather around the table, we realize that it is only your healing grace that can heal the brokenness of our life. We are grateful, O oh God, for the atoning sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was willing to lay down and offer his life up freely so that we might have life everlasting. We ask now, O oh God, that you bless this bread 
and that you bless this cup. And they may, they both represent to us your presence, your grace, your mercy. We ask, O oh God, that you set them apart from all worldly use. For it is in Christ's holy name we humbly pray. You'll peel back the first layer. Take the bread, the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. we drink the cup his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins let us pray God, how good it is to gather around your table with not only our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but to gather around the table with our brothers and sisters of Christ. For we realize, O God, that it is only you that could take such a gathering and through the power of your love and grace make us one. We thank you, O God, for the moments in our life when you reach down and touch us in the depths of our souls. When your grace transforms our lives and enables us to become the person that you created and redeemed us to be. We pray now, O God, that the power of your spirit has worked in our life this day and that we leave this place today like the woman at the well, ready to drop our jar of water and tell the world what Christ has done for us. Bless now, O God, all of us, both individually and collectively as a church. For it's in Christ's holy name we humbly pray. Amen. It says in the scriptures that after they had finished sharing the holy sacrament, that then they sung a hymn. So will you stand with me as we sing our hymn, Blessed Be the Tithe. I don't know about you, but if I heard the weather forecast this week, there's no precipitation. Amen. If it never was any ice or snow from now on, this is the embodiment of the happiest person in the world. You know, and you don't know how it is when you live with a school teacher who prayed all of her life for snow days. There's like a war going on in our house, praying it doesn't, 
she's on her knees praying harder than it does. So, so far it looks like she's winning this year. <laughs> so, some of y'all need to move over to my side. Remember all the opportunities that are available to you throughout the day and throughout the week. We continue our study in the book of Acts. I think it's Acts 17. I finally got the day group caught up with the night group. So we're all on the same page this week, which will make it easier on an old man. We are commissioned as cares of love. The attention we give to others is contagious. We seek to honor all people by listening to them. We want to provide practical help to those in need. We are sent out to do good and to be merciful. Our trust in God who equips us to serve. Strong, fear not, for God will save those who trust God will realize God's blessing. 